A tip of the cap to you and welcome to the Pilot Money Guys podcast where we're going to talk some aviation news, some questions from the flight deck, and aim to bring you some lighthearted financial fun with our topic du jour, reasons to be optimistic as an investor, maybe as a person as well. I'm your host, wealth manager and major airline pilot, former Air Force heavy pilot, Robert the Rubber Mallet Eklund, and I'm joined, of course, by one of our illustrious founders and former major airline pilot, as well as former F-16 fighter pilot, Charlie the Godfather Mattingly. Uh, well, thank you. Godfather. Thanks, Captain Rubber Mallet. I'm a lot of former. I'm a former a lot of stuff. A lot of formers. I'm a quitter. I'm a quitter, man. <laughs> as long as you're not a former financial advisor, I'm That's good. right. That's right. Not, not, not one of those. Let's do the, uh, let's jump into the aviation news. Uh, you got anything on that, Charlie? I've got, I've got one article here about the... Uh, passenger compensation yeah you do that and then i'll talk a little bit of artificial intelligence in the cockpit Ooh, nice Ooh. okay so uh this one comes to us from uh, simply flying but president biden and secretary of transportation uh, pete Buttigieg announced the administration is starting the rulemaking process to increase accountability on airlines for controllable delays or cancellations the president said later this year my administration will propose a historic new rule that will make it mandatory not voluntary, but mandatory for all U.S. airlines to compensate you with meals, hotels, taxis, ride shares, and rebooking fees, and cash miles, and or travel vouchers whenever they're the ones to blame for the cancellation. That's a lot. Or delay, the president said. And that's all on top of refunding the cost of your ticket. So lots of uh, new rules. It sounds like it may be coming out because of the uh, recent uh, meltdowns that's happened. Uh, the president encouraged travelers to visit flightrights.gov to find out what exactly mm -hmm. uh, airlines owe them or owe you. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, currently, yeah. when an airline cancels a flight for any reason, consumers can demand a refund of the unused part of their ticket and certain extras that may that might have uh, that uh, they might have paid to the airline, such as fees or checking ba a bag or getting a seat assignment or what have you. Uh, but oftentimes, the airlines will try to persuade consumers to take a travel voucher instead of a refund. So the Department of Transportation has no fixed compensation structure as of yet, but it looks like they're working on that. Uh, so that's a, that's all I got on aviation news. I'm sure there's going to be some more coming out here, but no. what do we got on artificial intelligence? Oh man, it's uh, it's interesting. Well, first on the regulations, you know, to me, Rob, <clears throat> as long as it's fair, if if all airlines are doing the same thing, yeah. to me, that's I mean, whether whether it's good or bad, from my opinion, if everybody's playing by the same rules, hopefully that makes it a level playing field. So whether that's, you know what I mean? I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, no, I, <clears throat> I would, uh, it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, the government is getting involved here or has to yeah. get involved, they feel, because of the recent meltdowns. But yeah. yeah, as long as it's across the board and no airline gets an advantage over the other, I think that's okay. Um, but you know, one of the uh, one of the president's comments there was talking about, hey, uh, this legislation is coming because of the bailouts that happened. So oh, you, basically, you airlines, you need to to deliver more to your passengers ah. because uh, the American populace bailed you out. So, yep. <laughs> kind of, I'm paraphrasing there, but that was kind of interesting. Interesting, yeah. yeah. Well, that'll be interesting how it plays out. But um, I was looking in this week into uh, I finally dug into a Chat GPT. What the heck is chat GPT? Uh, you know what I mean? It's like, what, what is going on here? All of a sudden, everything's artificial intelligence. Everybody's talking about it. So, so I dug in a little bit because I saw an article on uh, something that we subscribe to, the air currents, all about airline news, kind of latest and greatest stuff. So they have an interesting article that I'll refer to here in just a second about how, how is artificial intelligence going to, um, you know, enter the cockpit. What, what does that look like? So yeah. we'll talk about that in a second because it's interesting. But first, Chat GBT, GPT, which <laughs> GPT stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. So oh wow, like, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's so it's fascinating because it's basically like software that can understand the context and relationship between words and a sentence. Developed by OpenAI in November 2022, a uh, Chat GPT anyway. I guess there's others out there, but this is fascinating because it understands context and it understands it can write. Can you imagine oh, yeah. being a, co a college professor? Like, I don't know if my kid wrote, you know, a student wrote this or the AI wrote it or whatever. So that's kind of what's going on right now in, the, in that world. But it's, it's pretty fascinating. My uh, uh, son's obviously going through high school right now 
And not that he's using it uh, for that kind of stuff, but it, it gives a lot of context. You got to be careful because it'll give you bad information, but it'll tell you, you know, a lot of stuff about a lot of different things that give, fills in the gaps that, you know, you're kind of wondering, uh, you know, I don't know about music. He's got a music class that's harder than all get out, but it's like music in uh, you know, whatever the 1800s. And Chappy GPT will say all kinds of stuff to, wow. that, you know, kind of fills in the gaps. Hopefully yeah. it's accurate. That's, that's the problem. I know. It's not, I think they're, uh, they've made a lot of changes recently. I know there's been some, yeah. some issues with some of the responses, but I think it's, it's happening fast. And I'll share my screen real quick with those that are on uh, YouTube with us. But um, uh, we, you know, you and I both love this visual capitalist um, website. They put out some amazing okay. graphics and a lot of great information but it talks about what jobs will be most impacted by chat GPT. And so let's take a look. Um, but interestingly, the um, what makes your job exposed to GPT is the, the uh, higher, I don't know, white collar stuff. You know, obviously it can't go in there and fix a toilet or, you know, do plumbing, electricity, you know, wire a house. So a lot of these people that on, this, on the screen, you can see here the writers, computer programming, um, repetitive, repetitive and routine type work. And, and so those are things that are going to be, you know, uh, yeah. integrated now, now. I don't think this is anything to fear because one of the lessons we learned about economics, uh, is remember back pre world war two, I think it was, I think 98% of men were farmers or, you know, the, they were all, everybody was farmers basically. Right. Post world war two, we come back and, you know, uh, the wor world changes, obviously. And I think today, one to 2% of people are farmers. So, you know, there, there'll be other things that, that come up. So it's, uh, like I said, nothing to, to fear, but maybe, yeah. maybe Rob, that's my eternal optimism. Well, that's a great segue into our, <laughs> our, our financial topic when we get there. That's, that's I know it. I know good. it. It is but, interesting though. I'm a, I'm is. a uh, fifth generation rancher. My son's a sixth generation when, when he yeah. gets out there and gets on the horse, I guess. But, uh, uh, and obviously yeah. rancher for me is, is, uh, a part-time gig, but, yeah. but, uh, it's interesting. There's not that many around, you know, you yeah. say that and people are like, Whoa. So exactly. Yeah. So it kind of puts it into context on how the yeah. economy can change and who knows, I don't know if artificial intelligence is going to have that kind of impact. Maybe it will, but there'll be other things, uh, that, that, um, that come up, but there was a great article in the, the air current, which we subscribe to, and it talks about how artificial intelligence is being tested in cockpits right now. So I'll go ahead and read it, a uh, part of it anyway. It's, um, her name, the, the author's name is um, Elon. I hope I got that right, Elon Head. And she's written a, a bunch of great articles on these topics, just the latest and greatest technology. You know, electric uh, airplanes, uh, hydrogen powered airplanes was a lot of the articles that she's written about. But basically she says, when it comes to communication between flight crews and air traffic control, voice transmissions over radio have a lot of drawbacks you know we know that sometimes there's misinterpreted so sometimes they're stepped on simultaneous calls so um but basically they're saying that all, uh, all of the communication reasons are compelling reasons for moving air traffic management to a system primarily based on digital data don't know exactly what that means but she says because of wholesale transformation of the voice-based at system ATC system is unlikely to happen anytime soon. Some researchers are exploring how to use natural language processing, NLP, which is a branch of artificial intelligence focused on understanding human speech and writing to reduce workload for pilots and air traffic controllers. So, I mean, they've got uh -huh. some real world examples going on out there and you trying to use this stuff. I don't fully understand don't, exactly what I that means. I don't mean. quite understand it. Maybe yeah. she doesn't know she's talking about Charlie because there's CPDLC, right? <laughs> yeah. CPDLC is exactly what she just described, I think. And we're yeah. using it more and more. More centers are using it more mm -hmm. and more. I don't know. Is that, does that make any sense? One example she gave was it was used to transcribe a controller's taxi instructions and overlay them on a cockpit display of the airport environment. Um, huh. and oh, so, that, that would be pretty cool. Yeah. That's <laughs> especially, uh, you know, hair, it's kind of hard to know exactly what, uh, how and, else this will be applied, but. And I think that hits the nail on the head. You just don't even know what, I know. what the possibilities are going to come up and what uh, the, the next generation or our generation or, uh, the past generation is going to do with all of this, oh, yeah. you know, newfound uh, technology and, and how it's going to, as long as it doesn't kill us, we're all good. I, think, I know maybe. it's just interesting. All the things are testing in, in these fronts in yeah. the aviation world, man. It's 
there's a lot of stuff going on. It's uh, it's going to be interesting yeah. to see what what you know plays out. For sure, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I hope some of it plays out after I'm retired, but yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, all right. Yeah. This podcast is brought to you by Leading Edge Financial Planning. Let's bring it down a notch and get real for a second, Charlie. Okay. Ready. What do you want out of life? I'm going to ask you to stop, think about it, maybe even pause this podcast. I mean, don't pause the podcast, but think about pausing the podcast (laughs) after the podcast is over. Think about it, okay? As Warren Buffett recently said, write your obituary and then try to figure out how to live up to it. If you'd like some help with uh, figuring this out, you can give me or Charlie a call. You can reach me at 719-624-7055. Please not after 9 o'clock. Or Charlie, you can reach him at 865-240-2292. I think he goes to bed at 6, though. I do. uh, Early. early, I'm an early 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 to bed guy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> awesome. Yep. All right. I love now your advertisement. To- I love your advertisement. Yeah. You know, today I was talking to a, a guy coming out of the gym and I was like, man, I read all this stuff about growth and developing your vision. And, you know, we want to do that, but we also want to live in the moment. Right. So yes. I think there's this constant tension and that's what we do, Rob, with our clients is we try to find that balance. And so, um, you know, I love that because yeah. it typically say any, any, take any married couple one person's going to be the visionary or or looking ahead preparing the other person's going to be hey we got to live in the moment you know so how do we find that balance man that's hard to do yeah yeah it's uh it's a it's a good uh, workout for sure for the brain and for uh, your financial advisor so yeah it's uh and it's nice to talk to someone about it to be honest yeah uh, speaking of which we got to get our next uh uh, Jan and I have to get our next uh, meeting with you, Charlie. Yes, so. let's do that. Uh, <laughs> anyways, b- back to the show. Reasons to be optimistic. Here's a song by Charlie. Yes. Now, I can't take credit for writing this, of course, but I uh, just like every other idea, I, I usually just steal it. But, you know, the you and I talked about doing this. It's like, man, optimism is not cool. It's so uncool t- to be optimistic, but... I think we've got to find reasons to be optimistic these days. And really where this stems from, Rob, is that you and I, we watch the news. We keep up with what's going on in the world. We want to be able to inform our clients and help them understand what's noise, what's applicable to your retirement investments and what's not. So we keep up with this stuff. But man, it gets, you know, a little bit overwhelming sometimes. And we've really got to work to maintain an optimistic attitude. So yeah. and I'll, I'll start with the song. Through. A quick, uh, quick little note there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's funny, you know, we keep up with some things, but there are some things that I'll get a question about. I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? Yeah. I got one the oh, other day true. from a client. I'm like, yeah. what, what are you talking about? And I Google it. I'm like, no, that's not what's going on right now. That's <laughs> true. Like it's some, uh, you know, off the, they read it on the internet. So it must be true. But Absolutely. Anyways, I want to hear the song, Charlie. Okay, here goes. Here's the song. Ready? You may or may not recognize it. And I'll tell the story afterwards. Um, the preacher man says it's the end of time. And the Mississippi River, she's going dry. The interest is up and the stock market's down. And you only get mugged if you go downtown. (laughs) Okay, now what does this song have to do with being optimistic? Okay, that song sounds depressing, doesn't it? Yeah. It was written in the country song. It's written in the 80s. It's one of my favorite country songs by Hank Williams Jr. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so when we were in the air force rob and pilot training we all had to have our own karaoke song wherever we, we went to a karaoke <laughs> that, bar that was yours, huh? every weekend that was my song i had to karaoke that song anytime we went to this particular bar but the point is is you look back in the 80s and man people were upset people were like this is the worst time ever you're gonna get mugged if you go downtown the <laughs> Yes. The interest is yes. up, whatever that means. I think he might mean inflation or interest rates or whatever, but yeah, yeah. You know, Hank, Hank, he knew <laughs> what he was it. talking about. Yeah. Um, but the point is there are, you know, is it the times that we're in that make us pessimistic or is it us as humans or is it a mixture of both? And now before we offend anyone, there are some very difficult circumstances going on right now. Yes. We're not insensitive to that. Uh, there's some tough stuff out there. People, you know, school shootings, you name it's going on, but, but we've got to find reasons, uh, and they're out there. That's what we're going to talk about today, Rob, but you've got a lot on this as well. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to maybe, uh, frame some of the conversation. 
not really talking investing, although it, it does bleed over, uh, which it, we keep finding more and more uh, as we dive deeper into certain topics. But almost if you think about uh, just companies in general, almost every company or entity that was created uh, was created with an optimistic mindset. At least they thought that they could do something better, uh, make something more efficient or whatever. Uh, almost always it was started with an optimistic mindset. So that's kind of the... Uh, the uh, genesis of companies, I think, uh, even uh, Leading Edge, right, mm -hmm. uh, started that way. Southwest Airlines, uh, American, United, all of them started with a belief that they could do something either more efficiently or better, uh, either in a service or a product some way. But before we get to the particulars of investing optimism, let's just talk about the world in general. And this will fly, fly in the face of what you're hearing by a lot of uh, the uh, chicken little news organizations tapping into your fear centers right now. Mm -hmm. But the world is actually getting better. Not in every circumstance. There's obviously things that are going on that, that uh, we have to work on. And that's absolutely true. Uh, but consider this. Do you think the world is better, a better place than it was 200 years ago? And, well, 200 years ago, electricity was hardly used in any home. Uh, cars were barely better than bicycles, planes weren't invented, and disease was rampant. Cholera, ma uh, malaria, diphtheria, typhoid fever. And oh yeah, by the way, it took 11 hours a week to do the laundry. 11 <laughs> hours a week. If, if, if that alone isn't better, <laughs> I don't know what is. And even even then, you know, the, the hour and a half that you do uh, laundry now is mainly thrown in the... Uh, in the laundry there and, and uh, the machine does the work. So anyways, yeah. you may say, well, yeah, great. But what about more recently? Let's look at an article from the Atlantic and consider the nineties, right? I, I love the nineties, but since the 19, since 1990, poverty and hunger have declined dramatically while lifespans have increased on every continent, Charlie, every continent. Global smokers have declined by 20%, which obviously is gonna help the life expectancy. Children are roughly 30% less likely to be malnourished or stunted. Rates of tuberculosis have similarly declined by about one third. Maternal deaths per uh, live births have declined by 40%. And the prevalence of neglected tropical diseases such as uh, dengue and leprosy has uh, declined by roughly 70%. So a lot, of, a lot of facts out there, but all of it has been getting uh, going in the right direction. And the share of global population with access to toilets and safe plumbing has increased, you know, substantially. So. Uh, the quality of data collection obviously varies by the category and country, but overall, it is hard to argue that human pro progress is some sort of sales pitch from the pathologically optimistic, kind of like you and me, Charlie, mm -hmm. uh, probably some could argue that, but progress is simply a fact if you look at some of those numbers. So I've got, I've got a little more, but what do you think about that, Charlie? Anything to add? Uh, it's fascinating. I mean... It's so confusing, though, right? We, we know that those numbers and those facts are true. But at the same point, it's like, oh, wow, how can we, you know, somebody listening right now is like, how can you realistically argue the world is better? But there's a lot of stuff. We just don't hear about it. As, as you sip your coffee that's better than Starbucks, you just made from your espresso machine and you get in your car that you're driving yeah. that has more safety features than the space shuttle. Yeah. And, and even the violence you talked about, the article that I've, I've got here on our show notes, and, and there, uh, there's a guy named, his name is Hans Rosling. Uh, he's very famous. Google him. Go look at his TED Talks. He talks about everything that you just said as far as from the 1800s. Um, I looked at, looked at it today in preparation for this. You know, in about 1840, the life expectancy was age 40. <laughs> well, that was it. So in the early 1900s, it was... 50 or 60 maybe. And that's why social security is only, you know, they, you start at 65, people thought you might be on social security for like five years at the most, but, yeah. but, but anyway, it, it's very confusing. You know, there's a lot of reasons we'll talk about in a second, but, um, but yeah, but yeah, it check is. out the book factfulness, 10 reasons we're wrong about the world and why things are better than you think by Hans Rosling. Check that out, but go ahead, Rob, Rob. what else you got? I love it. Uh, let's consider the decline in the AIDS related deaths, right? AIDS, especially during the 90s and uh, through the uh, 2000s even was uh, a big, something that was a big problem on everyone's minds, right? Which is it was, it was really one of the great underappreciated triumphs of the 21st century. Uh, the article says here, uh, the Atlantic again, uh, decades ago, public health experts projected that about 5 million people would die of AIDS in 2020. 
And in 2003, President George W. Bush announced a new policy to combat the HIV epidemic around the world. At the same time, other countries and the global health organizations uh, distributed millions of antiretroviral drugs throughout Africa, where cases were rising fast, the fastest. And as a result, the number of global AIDS deaths has declined every year since 2005 to roughly 500,000, as opposed to 20 million in 2020. And that's according to the goalkeepers report. That means nine and 10 uh, projected deaths were prevented thanks to the hard work and ingenuity of governments and public health advocates. It's another bright spot in the global, global health is the decline of deaths in children under the age of five. In 1990, more than 8% of children died before their fifth birthday, which is just tragic. But that figure fell to 3.6% in 2021. Uh, Bill Gates, uh, obviously under some controversy here lately, but uh, said the biggest reason the number's gone down is that we've got vaccines out to almost all of the children in the world for these diseases like the measles. Uh, so just there's some there's some hard hitting facts there. Steven Pinker goes on, who's a Harvard, Stanford and MIT professor. Uh, he, he knows a couple of things. He's a psychologist. But back in 2018, he examined the question or got asked the question if uh, 2017 was the worst year ever. And in 2018, he analyzed uh, the, the recent data on homicide, war, poverty, pollution, and more, and found that we're doing better now in every one of those categories when compared with 30 years ago. He went on to say that we'll never have a perfect world and it would be dangerous to seek one, but there's no limit to the betterments we can attain if we continue to apply knowledge to enhance human flourishing. I don't agree with everything Stephen Pinker says, but there's some words of wisdom, no doubt, uh, there. Charlie. Yeah. The article that I referred to as well, I think probably had some overlapping information. In fact, all I did was Google, why are we pessimistic? There's a lot of healthy reasons for that. In fact, we don't all want to be too overly optimistic. We, you know, we miss things there. We don't survive some yeah. things, you know, it pays in, in our survival to, to be a little bit um, uh, of a pessimist at times or realist at least, but there's a lot of emotional biases and cognitive biases that that lend itself um, to us having that pessimistic bent. And the article that I read talked about some emotional biases that we have. Uh, in this article, he quotes uh, Kahneman and Tversky is arguing that one of the ways the human brain estimates probability is by using the simple rule of thumb or heuristics. You may have heard of heuristics before. That's shortcuts for your brain. But the, the, the basic rule of thumb is the more easily you can recall an example of something, the more likely you estimate it to be. So in other words, what we're seeing on the news, you know, whether that be a common event or not, it, we're going to make it a common event because that's what we're seeing. And so it's a big event, a recent event. And so we're overweighting that information and making it more prob probable in the future when, in fact, it's not. Yeah. So, you know, the brain develops these heuristics as shortcuts because uh, it's efficient. The brain wants to be efficient and it works 90 percent of the time. But there's a 10 percent of the time in there where these brain shortcuts do not help us. And one of those is the world of investing, Rob. I mean, you and I study this stuff all the time. It's fascinating. Yeah. And that kind of brings us to, OK, this is that's great. The world's getting better. Uh, we all love that. What does that mean for us as investors and clients and uh, people out trying to uh, save for our goals and dreams and, and our retirements there? So uh, it, I was looking back at a couple articles here, and this one was back in uh, July of 2022. It was an interview uh, with Morningstar that Larry Siegel, is, he's the author of Fewer, Richer, Greener. And he was asked by the interviewer, optimism seems like one of those secret weapons in investing, in finance in that if you're optimistic, you're more likely to stick with it, stick with your plan, and markets have tended to reward people who have stuck with it over the longer term. But it's hard to be optimistic about the long term, given how unknowable things are. So is the equity risk premium compensation for subjecting ourselves to that unknowability? Is it worth it? And Siegel says, you know, pretty bluntly, yes, <laughs> there are two kinds of risk. One is fluctuations in asset prices, we all know what that is because, you know, back in 22, uh, 2022 again, and more recently, the market just went down. Uh, we're feeling it and we might forget this, but it went down 34% in the spring of 2020, which is a profound dislocation in the markets. And a few months later, we'd forgotten about it, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously the COVID crash there. The other kind of risk is actually more profound and it's the possibility that our general expectations for assets are wrong. But he goes on to say, 
If you look back at equities, equities have returned about 7% plus inflation. And mm-hmm. that's a foot stomper with inflation being in the news. 7% plus inflation, which is pretty darn good. Uh, I do, he goes on, I do know enough economic history and regular history to know that living conditions have improved so much in the last 250 years, kind of uh, going back on this and we're foot stomping it. And actually in the last 50 years that you'd be kind of crazy to deny that things have improved. This mm-hmm. is a bad year and a bad decade. It's very easy to become pessimistic when you read the news or check the stock market or look at the world situation with wars and uh, so on and so forth. But underneath the surface of all that chaos and negativity, technology is continuing to advance. We just talked about AI, right? Mm-hmm. To advance at an amazing rate of speed. And what we really rely on for economic growth is improvements in technology, where I use the, where, you know, he goes on to describe what he calls technology, but it's gadgets and computing power and Zoom calls uh, from all over the world. Um, and basically he goes on to say that we do less work, right? We used to do an 80 hour work week, you know, miners were in the coal mines for mm-hmm. 80 hours a week. If they could do it, you know, sometimes they, they couldn't get those hours. Uh, of course they didn't want to be doing, uh, you know, mining for 80 hours a week, but they had to, to, to make the money. Mm-hmm. And uh, now that's, that's a rarity, um, for, for some people, obviously some people are working 80 hours mm-hmm. a week, but, uh, but it, I think it's just interesting how technology is kind of driving all of this uh, force, even though it sounds like, you know, you look at certain things and, and uh, the war in Ukraine obviously mm-hmm. is going uh, negatively, but uh, we're still, the economy still driving and technology is yeah. driving all of that innovation. And I, I don't know, I'll throw this at you, Charlie. I think there's a good, and I'm stealing this from other people, but there's a good uh, belief that they'll look back on, on this time as we look back on the late 1800s when there was all of that innovation going on, right? There were so many inventions, it's ridiculous. Some of the, I think the top 50 inventions, like 20 of them are from the, the 1800s, the late 1800s there. And I think they're gonna look back now at, as uh, that time where there's so much innovation and artificial yeah. intelligence and all that kind of stuff. Going on. Yeah, you're right. Because this, the article that I referenced, in fact, Rob, I just realized, I think it's written by the same guy you mentioned, Steven Pinker. Oh yeah. <laughs> so it's the same article. I have it, you know, in our show notes, if you all want to watch, uh, read it, it's fascinating, but he, he, he addresses what you just said. And, you know, he says people always pine for a golden age. They're nostalgic about an era in which life was simpler and more predictable. And, uh, a psychologist has argued that uh, this is so because people confuse changes in themselves with changes in the times. As we get older, certain things inevitably happen to us. We take on more responsibility, so we have a greater cognitive burden. We become more vigilant about threats, especially as we become parents. At the same time, we see our own capacities decline. As we get older, we become stupider in terms of the sheer ability to process and retain information. <laughs> And so he says, finally, he says, there's a strong tendency to misattribute these changes in ourselves to the changes in the world. A number of experimental manipulations bear this out. If you have people try to make some change in their lives, say to eat less fat, often they become convinced there are more and more advertisements for fatty foods. (laughs) So it's amazing. And this stuff, you know, why does it, why are we harping on this? We don't want people to, first of all, we want people to enjoy their lives. We don't want people to be angry. Um, But secondly, uh, pessimism, I think, leads sometimes, obviously, it can protect us in certain circumstances. It's a good balance to have. But sometimes in the world of investing, like you and I've seen, this overwhelming pessimistic attitude results in poor investment decisions. And you and I study behavioral finance a lot. And so we're trying to recognize these behaviors in ourselves and our clients. And if you go look at the Vanguard study, um, uh, Advisors Alpha, right? You know, what is the one of the biggest value ads an advisor can do? And that is actually behavioral finance. How do we make decisions? Are we using the right information? Are we using emotions or these heuristics like we talk about versus fundamental sound decision making from, you know, markets and and economies? So that's why it's so important, I think. Well, let's get into the nitty gritty. All right, uh, nitty gritty. Yes, you got some reasons why clients should be optimistic, like hard hitting. Let's get into the the weeds a little bit. We'll try to keep it to ten. Although I threw some of my own. Now we took, you know, I saw this um, article, Rob, from Financial Advisor. So that's an online magazine. Most most of our listeners probably have not read for obvious reasons. It's, <laughs> it caters to us, but it's interesting. Us, yeah. You don't see very many articles, and it says ten reasons 
uh, clients should be optimistic about the future. And this is by Bryce Sanders, uh, April of this year, 2023. And he talks about, hey, the news is grab, uh, designed to grab your attention. We know that. We know that the saying, if it bleeds, it leads, right? So that's what's going to be on the news. We just learn because of our heuristics. We're going to see that headline. We're going to project that as the most probable, probabilistic outcome. That's not true. But let's go real quick here rob and i'll i'll yeah. uh, pause on some if you want me to number one the united states is now a net oil exporter um so that is wow. a big deal can you you can remember like i came back to what was it 2007 8 9 where you know we thought we were going to run out of uh, uh energy we were you know at the mercy of uh opec and so boy about 2011 12 13 during that time frame that all changed and that is phenomenal. I mean, that was remember back in the seventies, uh, people waiting in line due to the oil embargo and all that kind of stuff. It's incredible. Yeah, that's fascinating. And, and that's a yeah. good reason to be optimistic about your, yeah. your future here in the US. Yeah. All right. Number two, the um, short term interest rates, you know, interest rates are going up, Fed's raising rates. And uh, as Hank Williams Jr. said, uh, stock markets down, interest is up or something, whatever he said. <laughs> um, but anyway, so the, the short term interest rates is really nice for savers right now. For our retirees, they've got an option other than just leaving their money in a uh, checking account and getting zero interest. Boy, three year or excuse me, three month CDs right now, three month treasury bills are up around 5%, which is incredible. Yeah. I think we mentioned on our last podcast, go out, back and listen to it. But uh, I want to throw this in there, Charlie. I kind of want at the end of the show, I don't know if you can get a, a recording of your karaoke uh, singing that song, but we, we maybe I'll just that. sing it. Maybe I don't know. I'm just I'll thinking. Tr- yeah. Yeah. Well, I want the real version. not the. <laughs> you know, that would be painful. It'd be painful for everyone. Um, you know, the third one there is, in fact, we just got a report out today. Inflation is moderating. Maybe not as much as some people would want. I think it came out at 4.9 um, year over year for the month of April, which is uh, heading in the right direction. Maybe not as fast as some people would like. Guess what, Rob? I mean, it's it's being, um, you know, flesh, uh, inflation is hanging around a little longer than we all want because guess what? The majority of people are working. Unemployment's at the lowest rate we've had in years. Um, we've had an incredible recovery after post-COVID as far as employment's concerned. And the growth is is high. You know, one of the headlines was, oh, no, basically, our economy is growing too much. It's like, well, you know, that's not good for inflation. It can't overheat. But still, there are worse things to have, you know, than a, than yeah. a growing economy. That kind of brought up to me, too, Charlie, uh, and inflation, while high inflation is bad, there's two parts of inflation. There's good inflation and bad inflation, right? High, Too high of inflation, which we've kind of experienced uh, recently, is bad because of all the uh, purchasing mm-hmm. power and all that, it goes away. But an acceptable low stable rate of inflation is actually good. Mm-hmm. And that's what, uh, you know, the Fed obviously is trying to, uh, they're always shooting, I think the federal uh, the FOMC is shooting for an inflation rate of 2%, I don't think, I know, yeah. uh, and to help achieve uh, the mandates of maximizing employment and maintaining price stability. And you might ask, why is inflation, how can inflation be good? And if you just kind of peel back the layers here and go, uh, go back to the 100,000 foot view, if you will, and look at, well, if prices start to decline and you've got deflation, right? Who's going to go buy a car? Who's going to go buy anything yeah. if they know it's going to be cheaper in the future? I I think, you know, people, this is obviously an argument to go back and forth, but I obviously wouldn't, I would wait, right? If I know yeah. a house is going to be cheaper, am I going to go buy a house or am I going to wait a couple of years and go get it at a, at a discount, discounted price? I'm going to wait. Um, inflation is kind of the opposite. If you have a little bit of inflation, you know, your dollars are going to not be worth as much in the future. And if it's a little bit, Hey, I'm going to go buy that house mm-hmm. now because in the future it's going to be higher. That kind of helps drive the economy and do some good yep. things there. So I just thought I'd throw that in there. Oh yeah. In 2008 and even 2020, you know, we had quantity of easing. Remember that QE one, yes. two, three, uh, it seemed like it went on forever and everybody complained that, Hey, the feds pumping money into the markets. It's, you know, too much money and we're going to have hyperinflation. Um, well, the Fed was really, and they always are, they're more fearful of deflation because of the reasons you just said, versus you know now hyperinflation is not good either there's no doubt about right. that but right. deflation yeah. was the higher risk in both of those scenarios that i just said so they had to you know that was their response was to quantitative easing you know and so that's another one of the things i think is um 
something to be optimistic about is remember back in the day and starting at 08, 09 and on into, I can't remember when it's finally started to abate, you know, the quantitative easing. I think it was 13, 14. Yeah. People were like, Hey, the, you know, stop pumping money into the markets. You're going to, you know, hyperinflation. Well, we're doing the opposite of quanti quantitative easing right now. They're pulling money out of the economy, you know, so there's a lot of different ways to do that, but that's, that's a good thing. Um, so that's, that's another one. I'm going to call that, uh, how about we call that number four? That's um, good. Number five is, uh, it's a good time to go out and seek low, lower cost providers of, you know, goods that people buy. In other words, to me, Rob, this means, you know, I have a little bit of choice as far as I know prices have gone up. It's really difficult when I go to the grocery store and it's 500 bucks for a family of, you know, five, but, um, but we have a little bit of choice. Like I want a new truck right now, but I'm going to wait a little bit. You know, I think I, I hope prices come down actually a little bit. I'm, I'm doing exactly what you just said. <laughs> yeah. I think prices are going to come down in the world of trucks. I'm waiting. So I get to, I get to have a little bit of control over my own personal spending, you know, and that that's a way to, to help mitigate that inflation impact a little bit anyway. I know that's not, op that's not an option for, for everyone, but most of our listeners, it, it is quite frankly. So we have a little bit more control over that one than we admit sometimes. Um, number six, the federal reserve is not run by dummies. Okay. So this is interesting. We love to bash the federal reserve. We love to bash, you know, all these people that are making these decisions, but Jerome Powell, yeah. yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, and he talks to this, this author here in this magazine article says as if he's the one guy deciding to raise or lower rates, you know, he's not the federal reserve has seven governors. The fed has 400 economists with PhDs. The Fed employs 3,000 people in Washington. It's a serious independent organization that puts a lot of thought into uh, decisions. Now, we're going to get a lot of kickback for that one. You know, people hate the Fed, but oh yeah, that's yeah. the truth. I mean, there, there's some very smart, talented people up there that care about, you know, the direction of the economy for sure. Um, yeah, and, and even though they have all those smart people, uh, they're doing the best, obviously, with the information that they have. That doesn't mean they're going to be perfect. They probably say it themselves. They know they're yeah. not going to be perfect every time there's no way to be perfect at least uh until ai kicks in and that's <laughs> right everything about everything i don't know <laughs> that's right but uh yeah so, you know this number seven is to your point earlier the stock market is the best way to make money consistently for decades it has been and so that is the that's still um you know a valid tool that we're going to have to be able to outpace inflation for for years to come unless the world ends as we know it so so that's important um the, the one of the ones he has here is he calls it riding high and it's basically based off of an economist article on april 15th it talks about riding high the lessons of america's astonishing economy and he quotes one sentence from that article and it says average incomes have grown much faster than in western europe or japan also adjusting for purchasing power, they exceed $50,000 in Mississippi, which is America's poorest state, which is higher than in, than in France. Our country has a lot of ingenuity, a lot of economic uh, prosperity. So that's, uh, that's one that I think is important as yeah. well. But um, what do you think, Rob? So far, I think we're on number eight. We got two more to go. What do you think? I don't know if we're counting correctly, but uh, yeah, I skipped a few. I, uh, somewhere in there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I skipped a few. Um, you know, basically, you know, one of the, one of the reasons I skipped a few is because I saw a couple others that I like more. And one of them was U.S. households financially are in better shape than they've been in a long time. Yes. Yes. You know, that's huge. And he didn't mention that in his article. So that's why I skipped a couple of his. I wanted to input some of ours because, you know, what happens when individuals or, or excuse me, our families, their balance sheets are healthier than they've been, that actually provides um, a barrier against uh contagion and what that means is if there's a shock to the economy in americans in particular and it applies to other countries as well in fact asian people are very very well known for saving like 50 percent of their income so when when there's a shock to the economy and, and consumers have a strong balance sheet that is a huge win for the economy because the economy basically especially the u.s depends on consumer spending in fact it's 70 percent 
of the economy is consumer spending, or I think GDP might be the right, right way to say that, but right. um, that's a big deal. And that's something that we overlook sometimes. So the last one, Rob, go ahead. <laughs> Which kind of kind of ties into the households yeah. that are in excellent shape and, and uh, just talking about population, right? The more households that are in better shape, the more they can go out and spend. And, and the more they spend, the more uh, money's out there for companies to go out and innovate and, and have ingenuity and the, you know, the labor market's out there. And if you have more people in the labor market, Companies can utilize that that labor uh, population to make those goods and services and, and mm -hmm. make the world uh, an easier, better place, hopefully. Uh, not always the case. But anyways, I think when we talk about why I'm, I'm optimistic, I think about population growth. And in mm -hmm. the uh, Congressional Budget Office's projections, the U.S. population is expected to increase from 336 million in uh, 2023 to 373 million people in 2053, population growth is increasing driven by net immigration. And if you think, hey, just to obviously talk in US here for a second, are we growing or are we shrinking? Well, people are having maybe fewer children. However, who doesn't wanna to come to the United States? We, mm -hmm. immigrants love the United States. They love the freedoms. They love all the things that we can offer um, in this country. So net immigration, which accounts for all the population growth beginning in 2042 there. Um, so there are uh, also millions of people switching out of the U.S. for a second that are projected millions of people that are projected to come out of a rise out, out of poverty in the next decade. Mm -hmm. And you may say, great, Captain uh, Rubber Obvious Mallet. What does that mean to me? And what it means is, you know, if you uh, if you have more people in the country, we already talked about what that means, more buyers, more sellers, and there's more labor for the companies to utilize. And that's pivotal for economic growth in a country. Right. More products can be made and purchased for from a growing prop population there. And that gives me a warm fuzzy that my investments will be just fine moving forward, even if there are dips, corrections and recessions mm -hmm. on the way. And then you might ask, why do I care about the people coming out of poverty? Well, what are those po people coming out of poverty? What are they going to want to do? They're going to want to buy what? They're going to want to buy iPhones. They're going to want to buy uh, computers, Coca-Colas, mm -hmm. McDonald's. They're going to buy German cars. They're going to ride on planes made by uh, Boeing and Airbus, right? So they're mm -hmm. going to want to buy and experience these things that have made the world a better place in the last 200 years or 50 years or 30 years. And uh, that's pretty exciting that you own mm -hmm. a piece of those companies that these people are going to go out and buy. So that's a good a good thing that the, those people are coming out of poverty because those those companies, even the U.S. companies, are global, and they're going to go out there and buy those goods, which is obviously going to reward you for investing in yeah. those companies. So nice, you nailed it, man. You to... nailed. That's a great number ten, and and I'll just piggyback on that one because demographics are huge as it pertains to long term economic growth. You know, population growth is absolutely critical, and we know that immigration is a really sensitive, hot topic. But immigration right. is healthy for a country if it's done correctly. That's what our country yes. is based on. And it's absolutely one of the advantages that America has for it is everybody in the world would give a body part to be where we are. And, and you and I have been in these other countries. I've been to China. I've been to Africa. Yeah. You know, you've been everywhere where they would, you know, jump on a plane with you and jump in your luggage if they could. And, you know, we're, we're very blessed for that. And that is a very uh, big advantage for our economy. And like I said, demographics are just so huge as it pertains to everything in an economy. Yeah, that demographics and the technology, I think it's a, those two driving forces are great ways to fund your dreams and goals and your retirement with those, yeah. with those uh, optimistic uh, qualities. Very nice, man. That's a good one. That's all, all I right. got. That's all I got. Uh, here we go. A couple of brief quotes to, uh, for you to ponder on your drive or flight or whatever morning ritual. And obviously, since we're talking optimism, uh, the first one's from a philosopher, historian, and psychologist, a lot of psychology today, William James. Uh, he was the first educator to bring uh, psychology to the United States, I believe, a psychology class. But anyways, he says, pessimism leads to weakness, optimism to power. It's about as blunt as you can get. The second from the late former uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Army Four-Star General, General uh, uh, Colin Powell, and former Secretary of State. And he says, uh, perpetual optimism is a force multiplier. Love it. So that's it. Um, and I would dare say it just kind of piggybacking on that. Uh, we all know some uh, special operators, special forces folks 
difference there. And uh, what is it most of them have, Charlie, that you've noticed? A lot of them have that eternal optimism <laughs> where they think they can do anything at any time. Anyways, yeah. uh, throw that in there. Okay, that's it. And, and obviously pilots are uh, a lot of times optimistic when they run into emergencies, but uh, that's it. Let us be the first to welcome you to our final destination of Flight 58, Reasons to be Optimistic. Did you learn anything from this free podcast? If so, pay it forward and tell someone about it, or at least leave us a review. We aim to make the world better stewards of their money. Uh, so help us do this, uh, please. Uh, shoot us any questions you have uh, or would like us to cover on the next questions from the Flight Deck episode. And remember, as Emerson said, the world makes way for those who know where they are going. And as I say, so plan accordingly. From all of us at the Pilot Money Guys, we optimistically wish you smooth rides and soft in the zone landings. Leading Edge Financial Planning, LLC, is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Leading Edge Financial Planning and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.leadingedgeplanning.com. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only. It does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. These documents may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from these projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur. All information has been obtained from sources believed to be reliable, but its accuracy is not guaranteed. There is no representation or warranty as to the current accuracy, reliability, or completeness of, nor liability for, decisions based on such information, and it should not be relied on as such.